There's an old question that people ask that is supposed to demonstrate one's outlook on life. That question is, is the glass half empty or half full? Now, the question itself might come off as basic psychology and you might laugh at it, but when you analyze this question and you get to what it represents, you begin to see the problems that plague us as individuals. Now, to help you realize what that means, I want to ask you, what does the glass supposed to represent? Does it represent ourselves? Does it represent the world and the society that we live in or our families? When you start seeing the glass like this, some questions begin to arise. And we recognize that everyone has different life experiences with success and failure, love and hate, pleasure and pain. However, the question here is, is there a common denominator that once we identify it, can serve as an antidote to most of, if not all, of societal ills? I believe there is. And that common denominator is self-esteem. Self-esteem is the one thing that everyone has or to some degree lacks. In varying aspects of our lives, self-esteem can dictate whether or not we flirt with the cute girl or guy that's working in the McDonald's drive through it, can also, it is also what drives us to new and exciting heights, such as moving to a faraway city, getting a new and hopefully better job, or it can lull us into the darkest scenarios created by our imagination, such as depression, despondency, ex um, detachment, and in some extreme cases, to suicide. So the next question that everyone asks once you realize this, is there a way that we can influence our self-esteem? Is there a way that we can make it grow? Can we change the view of ourselves and of our place in the world? Now, there have been thousands of self-help books that have been published and hundreds of years worth of philanthropists and philosophers who have thought about and have talked about this very subject. So let us begin with the symptom of the problem, self-esteem. What is self-esteem? Let's break it down. What is esteem? Esteem is respect or admiration that is typically given to a person or to a group of people. So self-esteem, in contrast, is respect or admiration towards oneself. And typically, when you hold someone or something in esteem, it's because you are noticing that they did something or are doing something that resonates with you. You are perceiving them. And that is the key factor to self-esteem. Perception. Self-esteem is the perception of yourself and how you fit into the world around you. Therefore, if we want to influence self-esteem, we must first address the perception. <clears throat> the definition of perception is a way of taking in external information, regarding it, understanding it, and or interp interpreting it. This is where people begin to differentiate when you ask them the question whether the glass is half empty or half full. We each perceive the glass differently because it, that is based off of the information that we have individually experienced and internalized. <clears throat> we have established that everyone experiences life differently, thus resulting in slight differences in opinion. So if you want to influence perception, you must first address the information that you or that other person has or will come in contact with. Now, if we're not careful, if we talk about the subject of what is considered correct information versus incorrect or limited or faulty information, that can be a slippery slope down towards freedom of expression, the validity of the press, etc. But we can address the concept of information itself. Now, our body exists in such a state that it is taking in information constantly. This is called ubiquitous assimilation, which means 
always absorbing everything everywhere all the time. This happens through our eyes, our nose, our taste buds, the feelings of the nerve endings <clears throat> at the end at, at our skin, um, and even through our ears. All this takes into information and our brain processes this without us even noticing. But what we do with that information is the key. For example, an artist will see the world through different eyes. They notice the, tr the shadows on trees differently. They realize the contrast between light and dark. From my personal experience, I prefer drawing on colored black paper, coloring on black paper, because in my opinion, it brings out the colors more. It adds a level of depth that I don't find or appreciate on traditional white paper or canvases. But you see, I have trained my eye to do such a thing. And the same thing applies to people who enjoy parkour or skateboarding or surfing, or those who listen to music and they write music theory. They take the information that already exists around us freely and they take it in and they give it a different meaning and turn it into something that is beautiful and unique. <coughs> so the next question is, can you train yourself to have higher self-esteem? The answer is yes. And it is not as hard as people say it is. The social psychologist Amy Cuddy argues that we can boost our confidence, thereby also boosting our self-esteem, by manipulating the, normal, the neurochemistry in our brains through power poses. Now, a power pose is pretty much a, taking a, a pose of dominance, like the superhero pose, or leaning back in your chair, stretching your feet out, and putting your hands back like this. You're, ex you're trying to exert dominance, and your brain to back that up produces the hormone testosterone. So those individuals in the test who participate in power poses for two minutes experience an increase in testosterone by 20%. And that's just from two minutes of doing that. Contrarily, those who did not participate in power poses experience a decrease in testosterone by 10%. Now, in contrast to testosterone, the body also produces another hormone called cortisol. Cortisol is a stress hormone, and the brain releases that during scenarios of fights or flight. It is is a, um, a hormone that, when the body releases it, increases levels of blood sugar. It increases the substances that are needed in tissue repair. In short, if it's not essential to your survival, cortisol shuts it down. And anything that is essential to your survival, cortisol puts it in overdrive. The long-term effects of prolonged exposure to cortisol are type 2 diabetes, increased levels of anxiety, depression, digestive problems, heart diseases like heart attacks, strokes, and high blood pressure. Those same individuals who participated in power poses experience a 25% decrease in cortisol levels, whereas those who did not perform the power poses experienced an increase in cortisol by 15%. So now that we've addressed neurochemical information and perception, the problem is that with most of these things, we can't quantify it, we can't measure it. And because we can't measure it, people like Jordan Peterson argue that self-esteem does not exist because we can't measure it. And in a way he's right, but we can agree that self-esteem exists in some shape or form and that too much of it develops people um, into narcissists, narcissistic bullies. And this is because they have experienced success in such a way that it all goes into their head. It spills over into every aspect of their lives. Contrarily, the opposite is true. Abysmal self-esteem can shut down an individual because you're experiencing extreme levels of cortisol. However, Despite the fact that most of it cannot be measured, we can employ certain ta tactics that, according to our individual needs, can help us have 
healthy levels of self-esteem, the basis of which can be summed up by three of the world's uh, great philosophers who said, know thyself, control thyself, and give thyself. First off with know thyself, Socrates etched that into the pillars leading up to the temple of Apollo. Know thyself, which means that you must recognize and understand your own limits of your own wisdom and your understanding, understanding your own abilities, what you genuinely and honestly know and, what, and knowing what it is you have yet to learn. The Roman philosopher Marcus Tullius Cicero said, if you have no confidence in self, you are twice defeated in the race of life. With confidence, you have won even before you have started. In short, control thyself. So let's bring in these two concepts. We start with ourselves. What am I good at? And then you ask the question, do I want to change that regarding the things that you're not good at? And then the confidence in your abilities and actions. Failure is a part of life, but Cicero and Socrates invite us to have, to take what we have, harness it, control it, and get to the next level. And finally, the carpenter from Galilee said, give thyself, let your light so shine before men. Every human being wants to be recognized, validated, and appreciated. The difference is, is that everyone wants these things to varying degrees. Some people want the limelight and others simply want a shout out or a small nod. A very good example of this in action is that most of the people who are depressed themselves want to help others who are in their dark place. See, our body subconsciously already knows that this works and it pushes us to help others. That's what it means to be a human being. To see this dramatized and in action, I recommend watching the movie called Detachment with Adrian Brody. In it, there are different scenarios that are juxtaposed to each other. One, identifying the barriers that we as a society have placed to protect. And in another scenario, he demonstrates exactly what people need to break out of their destructive spiral that plagues so many of, of the human race. And so, give thyself, no, know thyself, control thyself, give thyself. The human factor in all of this is essential to raising not only our self-esteem, but the self-esteem of others. This will lift them up, and from the self-esteem, that can turn into self-efficacy and progress and prosperity. Take out the human, the human ingredient, and it all falls apart as a society. This is what people need, and this is what society needs. Thank you.